Welcome to One on One with Ayanda Pillay. Today I have Insaf Mohideen joining me virtually from America. Welcome Insaf. Thanks for having me. So Insaf is Sri Lankan born but lives in America. He is a serial entrepreneur, investor and the CIO of one of the largest sovereign funds in the world. Could you please tell us a little bit about your experience Insaf? in the investment world. Uh, yeah, so I mean I've uh, been doing this for about 25 plus years uh pretty much you know done everything from angel investments to you know some stints of my own entrepreneurship and then probably the past 5 6 years in a more formalized way uh working with about three or four sovereign funds. I mean that's where really I've been uh, digging very deep into in uh, you know a lot more large scale investments uh investments that are basically multi cycle uh and also hence you know the visit to sri lanka etc it's basically tied to looking for those larger longer term investments sure so you were here in 2019 right after the easter attack yes i was right and you also came to sri lanka a week ago that's right what brings you back to sri lanka uh so after the easter attack was a very uh it, it was a emotional trip because uh, you know just watching it from uh uh you know a spectator perspective i felt like i needed to be on the ground just to see what's going on uh and uh just get a sense for the grand realities of the situation and uh, that's what really drew me back into uh pretty much uh, the entire realm of the social economic circle in Sri Lanka and uh you know since then I've been coming almost every month uh but in the past year just because of the coronavirus uh you know there was about a year's gap and then the last visit really was uh just to assess investment opportunities ground realities after not only a uh, presidential election but the parliamentary election and there was about a 3 month uh you know time frame since the parliamentary election so i really wanted to get an idea of you know what are the opportunities what are the priorities the current uh government uh as well as the industries have set for themselves right and if there was any alignment for uh, investors like myself to basically participate so what did you find out uh, i mean uh, definitely uh It was interesting to be on the ground in that you know all the new ministers were definitely getting their hands around their portfolios uh, but i did sense that you know the response to the virus uh, and the uh, approach that sri lanka has taken definitely has set it back in terms of that entire lockdown approach i'm more for the herd uh, immunity approach just like sweden went for etc Now, you know it has its pros and cons but at least you're not killing the economy so in this instance i felt like the oxygen definitely had been sucked out of the economy uh and we are seeing uh results of that uh, so that was my general impression but in terms of you know obviously uh meeting a lot of the uh portfolio ministers uh industry leaders they definitely have a lot of projects lined up uh and there's excitement uh, if we can get past this uh, hurdle so you're right i mean sri lanka has a credit rating of triple c which puts us on the same rating as congo and a few african countries so as an investor what is your take on it and would you invest in sri lankan sovereign bonds i mean uh, the credit rating issue has been addressed multiple times and uh, it- from my understanding and i do believe that uh, you know we have access to emergency funds if we did want to tap into it but uh, i think the current uh, uh economic policy is really to get inflation under control to basically get debt under under control and also basically currency devaluation right which has been a huge issue uh, ultimately for investors so from that perspective certainly i think uh, you know any economy that tries to do that does go through those initial shocks right become shocks and the fact that they've decided to do it at this instance very interesting but nonetheless 
uh, if it is part of the agenda, not a bad timing. Uh, but you know, just outside looking in, a credit risk agencies really their job is to assess risk as fast as they can and outline it. But having talked to all the economic leaders and uh, financial leaders, there's certainly no inherent risk of us defaulting. Uh, that I have fair certainty. And if I was a bond investor, I would probably invest. But here, here's the issue with bond investments. It's not for people like me. It's mostly for very conservative investors. So you have typically the Templetons, the pension funds of the world investing. And these guys are using public funds, so they they just really can't uh, make those investments and uh, buy Sri Lankan bonds when the rating's been thrashed. So that's really the chicken and egg problem that Sri Lanka's having now. Is while you know, I do believe it's it's a fairly discounted bond where you can make some very quick, easy money. Uh, you just can't put in large scales of money that uh, public's entrusted because of the credit risk, uh, the perceived credit risk. So uh, you've been involved in tech investments in the past. Yes, I have. Would ICT in Sri Lanka excite you in investment? Unfortunately, uh, you know, I would love to do that because that's really my forte and that's uh, ultimately a huge passion of mine. Uh, I would love to see a little more excitement, a little more activity on that front. I was hoping that, uh, you know, post-presidential parliamentary election, we'd see a lot more of that. I'm not seeing that yet. Um, I'm definitely seeing, I mean, even this time I talked to a few entrepreneurs, just given the investor bubble restrictions, I couldn't reach out to more. But a lot of those projects, ideas, uh, you know, you have to compete at a global level. So when I look at some of these ideas, it's a lot of me too ideas. Uh, a lot of, in my opinion, you're just, the technology is dated, some of it's already been done, uh, you know, robotic automation, etc. Uh, just, you know, ideas that are at least, you know, five, six years dated in terms of technology, in terms of ideation, etc. But where it lacked excitement mostly was in that, you know, a lot of this innovation is just very Sri Lanka centric. Right. Uh, you know, we need, uh, we, we do have the skills and we have this unique opportunity where you don't need a visa, you don't need to be in the US, you don't need to be in Europe to create the next big technology, the next unicorn, right? So uh, I'd like to see that. Okay. And I understand you are interested in uplifting the youth. Absolutely. Um, any initiatives in Sri Lanka that have taken place or you're trying to spur at the moment? So at this point, you know, it's been my first trip after a year. So there's, this, you know, a lot of momentum was lost in just the inability to get uh, into the country. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we've uh, rented some office space and we still can't get that going because, uh, you know, we're continuously, you know, running into all kinds of issues in terms of, again, pandemic related. Uh, you know, first thing for me is uh, to get my, uh, you know, venture set up. So my uh, satellite office in Sri Lanka set up in three ventures. And then definitely we want to start hosting some youth hackathons, youth conferences, just to get the ideation process going even, right? To get people excited, interested. And I think a good start would be to get, you know, the Sri Lankan youth connected with some of the hackathons, activities that are going on in Silicon Valley, etc. So we just start having this, uh, exchange and flow of information. So, you know, six, eight months into it, we are able to then generate our own ideas and then a certain level of excitement. So definitely, you know, hackathons, uh, then be possibly uh, some incubator activity, and then ultimately to do angel venture investments. When you say hackathon, um, could you just elaborate a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So what happens is, you know, a hackathon can take multiple formats, but the whole idea is to bring a whole bunch of uh, youth, coders, ideas guys, and uh, you know, um, uh, user experience designers into one room and lock them in uh, uh, rather conference uh, center or whatnot, right? And typically anywhere from 30 to about 200 people come in. And then there's a socialize socialization element followed by very specific problems that are given to them. For instance, you know, 
Tesla would host a hackathon where that where they'd say, "Hey guys, you know, we want the the you know someone to hack into one of our cars and pretty much auto drive it out of a parking lot. Whoever does this essentially gets funded for the idea. They get a free Tesla, etc." But uh, there's also ideation hackathons where you would basically go in with an idea, pitch it, and pretty much develop a small element of that code uh, over the next 48 hours. You know, the most exciting element of that code. So, for instance, you know, if you were Airbnb uh, eight years ago, you would probably develop that entire, you know, this, a small piece of code that would pretty much show you the possibility of, you know, the crowd. Uh, crowdsourced uh, hoteling model. At the end of it, you'd also have investors who are basically there, who would basically either pick some of these guys to either work on some of their portfolio. Yeah. Um, when you look at the Sri Lankan system, right, are people ready to be entrepreneurs? I hear it a lot. Okay, people want to be their own boss, they want to start their thing, but here's the thing, you, you give them a pot of gold and some may not know what to do with it. So how do you lead them to be entrepreneurs? How do you lead them to generate more income and, and leverage? Absolutely. So a great question. I mean, inherently, if you think about it, it's, you know, we're all entrepreneurs at some level, right? So, you know, your local storefront owners, each and every one of them is an entrepreneur, you know, and we have billion dollar entrepreneurs as well, right? I mean, uh, you take a uh, look at, you know, all the, Business leaders in Sri Lanka, in dollar terms, they're multimillionaires, and some of them billionaires, all entrepreneurs, homegrown. Uh, but what differentiates them from entrepreneurs, uh, let's say in the US or Europe, is they're just a select few who just have the wherewithal and who either had the financial backing, or most more importantly, they had unbelievable and tremendously. Uh, focused individuals, right? I mean, these are tremendously razor sharp focused individuals with massive passion. Uh, but how do you take the masses who have ideas, not quite the, you know, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs level of focus, right? Yes. And make them entrepreneurs. That's, that's only going to ha happen when you have the systematic infrastructure as well as the society, right? I mean, you have to have that social shift. And the social shift happens when there is the cool factor. But when you have a bunch of entrepreneurs essentially start off with the excitement of the starting phase uh, and, you know, they go through the norming phase, forming phase, but then they fall flat on their face a year or two later, either because there's no funding yes. or they can't compete in the global market, then everyone's looking, they're like, wow, you know what? A corporate job seems so much better and sexier than entrepreneurship. Let's hold off. So for that to happen, you know, we have to develop a culture. Uh, I, I do believe that State Minister Nivad Cabral has talked about setting up a uh, venture fund, uh, a government funded venture fund. Uh, so that's a great step. But we also need to basically have incubators set up and uh, the ability to compete at a global level, which means opening up payment gateways, etc. So that any technology that's built, uh, you know, number one, they can compete with you know global ventures to gain access to capital but also if you have a your e-tail retail uh you know e-commerce platform you should also be able to sell very easily freely and publicly to a global population if not if not just a global population at least a you know regional population right so that's how a lot of the entrepreneurs in bangladesh are doing really well while they have a much larger economy to sell to than sri lanka they still are opened up to, you know, neighboring Nepal, India, Pakistan, that region, right? So we have to be able to compete at least at a regional level. I've seen some great ideas, right. but none of those are going to survive in Sri Lanka. So I think really infrastructure wise, government's got to basically set up some incentives. And then ultimately, I think that it behooves local business leaders and you know other successful individuals even banks for instance you know contributing into some of these ventures because the loan model doesn't work right in this uh, how you've had entrepreneurial success is by equity models uh, sure. where you know someone tries fails they are able to walk away but in sri lanka today really the only funding opportunity available is 
you either basically go after your three F friends, families, and fools, or you basically are raising loans. Uh, yeah. That is just not conducive to entrepreneurship. Okay. Okay. So um, tell me about um, your interest here. Do you have a, a, an ecosystem set up here to assist you with this? Absolutely. So I have a fairly extensive team uh, of uh, individuals, everything from sales to uh, individuals who basically do my analysis uh, and are able to run uh, day to day operations. Uh, but the biggest challenge for me obviously has been just evaluating and uh, understanding what opportunities I pursue. And this last visit was one of many visits that will basically help me kind of understand, filter and start making progress on a few ventures that we've identified. Fantastic. If you were given the strategy uh, to elevate Sri Lanka economically, what would you do? Obviously, you know, I'm not a macroeconomist, no, <laughs> am I uh, basically in the realm of running a country, but uh, just looking at it you know, outsider looking in as an entrepreneur, I think a few things have gone right. You have the stability and there's very consistent messaging. Now, whether the global markets believe it or not, the messaging has been very consistent. We are not going to default on our bonds. We want to basically control uh, imports so that we can get a better handle on the currency. And then we want to cut through red tape and make it easier to do business. All of the right things. We need to just implement on those. Right? So we need to basically make sure it's easier for investors to get into the country, make investments. And uh, uh, again, you know, the bureaucracy needs to be fairly easy to get through. Uh, you know, in my, in my instance, you know, when I was there this trip, one of the things I found was, uh, you know, there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of thoughts that are going around, but it wasn't necessarily packaged and ready for investors. Uh, so that that's something I would definitely advise, uh, you know, individuals and leaders that I met. I con constantly kept advising them and continue to advise them is let's get our act together. Yes, we've been through a pandemic. Everyone's been impacted, Sri Lanka and small economies more so. But how we're going to get out of this is let's have razor sharp focus in terms of how we attract those investments and who we go after. So, for instance, you know, if you walk into uh, any investment house today as a billionaire and say, listen, hey, I want to invest. First thing they ask you is what's, what your risk profile is. And uh, based off your risk profile, they'll line up certain investments and that's where they woo you. Uh, Sri Lanka needs to be able to do the same thing, right? Not everyone needs to go see Port City. Not everyone needs to see every infrastructure project because that might or might not align with individuals. Uh, you know, there are bond buyers, there are infrastructure players, there are more high risk players. So we have to be able to package it and be able to sell. So even uh, when I met with the BOI chairman, one of the things I said is, you know, I'm sure he realizes already is, we have to aggressively sell the country, whether it be tourism, whether it be investment opportunities, uh, the days of, you know, people digging, finding, coming to Sri Lanka, probably, uh, are, are done and dusted primarily because you know you have places like uh, Ireland and a ton of places even you know the Arab countries are massively advertising marketing themselves as economic hubs as the places to come do business as the places to basically come and you know, you know spend your money Dubai is doing a massive campaign on tourism so where do we stand in that so we need to definitely sell ourselves we have a lot of uh, redeemable traits and a lot of inherent qualities that make Sri Lanka very attractive and stable. We got to sell it. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for your time and thank you for joining me.